and welcome to 5MI Weekly. Today, let's talk about sex ed again. In our last two weeks of talking about sex ed, we defined education and found out how controversial it becomes when its main topic of learning is sex. But surprisingly, we also found tremendous support for sex education. And I've not forgotten, last week, as well as the week before, I left you with a question of whether you think sex should be taught by abstinence only or comprehensive sex education programs. Before you answer this question, let's see what effects, if any, sex education has on its students. Dr. Helen Chin and her colleagues at the Community Preventative Services Task Force conducted one of the most comprehensive reviews of the research literature comparing abstinence only and comprehensive K through 12 sex education programs. Chin compared six potential effects of these sex education programs, which included frequency of sexual activity, number of sex partners, frequency of unprotected sex, use of condoms or hormonal contraception, pregnancy, and sexually transmitted infections. After examining 6,579 research articles that reported the results of abstinence-only and comprehensive sex education programs, Chin found adolescents who completed comprehensive sex education programs had less frequent sexual activity, a smaller number of sex partners, less unprotected sex, a higher probability of using condoms and hormonal contraception, and were less likely of being pregnant or having a sexually transmitted infection. For abstinence-only programs, Chin's meta-analyses yielded inconsistent findings across studies, which varied by follow-up time and design. This led Chin to conclude, it is unclear what effects, if any, abstinence-only programs have on their students. Although in theory, both abstinence-based and comprehensive sex education programs should affect students' sexual attitudes, knowledge, behaviors, and health, Chin's findings show this to be only true for comprehensive sex education programs and not true for abstinence-based sex education programs. Chin finding no effects for abstinence-only sex education programs is mostly consistent with what others have found. For example, when Douglas Kirby of the National Campaign to Prevent Teen and Unwanted Pregnancy reviewed the research literature on sex education programs, he found abstinence-based sex education programs have no effect on rates of teenage pregnancy or sexually transmitted infections and are ineffective in changing sexual behaviors, including the rate of vaginal sex, number of sexual partners, and condom use. Why I said Chin's findings are mostly consistent with what others have found concerning abstinence-based programs is because some abstinence-only sex education programs have been found to increase sexually maladaptive behaviors. For example, Dr. Anthony Pack from the University of Massachusetts and his colleagues found adolescents who take virginity pledges as part of an abstinence-based sex education program are less likely to use contraception when compared to adolescents who do not take virginity pledges. Often built into abstinence-only sex education programs, a virginity pledge is a commitment made by a student to refrain from sexual intercourse until marriage. Among adolescents who have not had vaginal intercourse, virginity pledgers are four to six times more likely than non-pledgers to engage in oral and anal intercourse. Hmm. And schools with students taking virginity pledges have significantly higher rates of sexually transmitted infections and non-marital and teenage pregnancies mm. than schools with students not taking virginity pledges. In fact, 
sexually transmitted infection, and teenage pregnancy rates can be reliably predicted simply based upon knowing whether schools are using abstinence-only sex education programs. For example, if you wanted to know which of the United States has the highest sexually transmitted infections and teenage pregnancy rates, then all you would have to know is which states require abstinence-only or comprehensive sex education programs. Of the 50 United States, 25 of them require sex education to be taught primarily from an abstinence-only perspective. The average rate of sexually transmitted infections for these states is 27 per 1,000 people, and the average rate of teenage pregnancies for these states is 24 per 1,000 live births. Six states require sex education to be comprehensive, as defined as being medically accurate, covering contraceptives, and being inclusive of sexual orientation. The average rate of sexually transmitted infections for these states is 20 per 1,000 people, and the average rate of teenage pregnancies for these states is 17 per 1,000 live births. Although at a historical low, the United States teenage pregnancy rate ranks dead last when compared to other developed countries. The reason for this ranking is simple. Countries like Switzerland, the Netherlands, and Denmark with low teenage pregnancy, miscarriage, and abortion rates also happen to have the most comprehensive, age-appropriate, medically-based kindergarten through 12th grade sex education programs. While countries like the United States and England with high teenage pregnancy, miscarriage, and abortion rates also happen to have mostly abstinence-only, non-medically-based, only grades 6 and 10 sex education programs. The picture is pretty clear on the power of comprehensive sex education within schools, but inevitably, when the conversation is initiated to have comprehensive sex education within a school's curriculum, someone says, It's a parent's duty to teach their children about sex, not the schools. Of which, just once, I wish someone else would reply to this person and say, But who's teaching the parents about sex? Now, I'm not saying parents shouldn't have a role in their children's learning. In fact, parents have the greatest role in their children's learning about sex. But whether this role will have positive or negative effects on their children's sexual attitudes, behaviors, and health is entirely based on whether or not parents are consistently teaching their children about sexuality in open, honest, authentic, and comprehensive fashions. Intentionally limiting information about sex and sexuality through abstinence-based programs in schools or enigmatic the sex talks between parents and children have significant negative consequences on sexuality. And these consequences occur regardless of whether it's schools, parents, or even the government limiting information about sex. For example, when the state of Texas in 2011 reduced its family planning budget by two-thirds from $111.5 million to $37.9 million, one out of every four family planning clinics whose primary mission is to educate women about reproduction and sexuality were eliminated. The effects of this intentional limiting of information about sex and sexuality were immediate and dramatic. Dr. Marion McDorman and her colleagues at the Maryland Population Research Center found the year following the closing of the clinics, the maternal mortality rate nearly doubled from 18.6 per 100,000 live births to 33 per 100,000 live births and has remained significantly higher since. This dramatic increase in deaths is even more striking when you know the maternal mortality rate in Texas was stable at about 17 per 100,000 live births for more than 10 years before the clinic closures. In raw numbers, 
with the state of Texas having about 400,000 live births per year, this works out to 58 women every year or 403 since 2012 have died because of a systematic and intentional lack of sex education. Additionally, Dr. Annalisa Packham of Miami University found closing the family planning clinics increased Texas's teenage pregnancy rate by 3.4% and increased its teenage abortion rate by 3.1%. I no longer have to ask whether you think sex education should be taught in an abstinence-based or comprehensive fashion. Because it's beyond obvious what your answer has to be. Logic, parents, teachers, psychologists, physicians, scientists, community-based organizations, places of worship, and the data itself demand human sexuality to be taught in a comprehensive fashion. So this is what your answer has to be too. And this is how our schools are teaching it. And our government is reinforcing it. Right? Um, sorry folks, I'm pretty sure Dr. Don is okay. I think he just passed out. In either case, tune in next week where Dr. Don will get a dose of reality. And either he or I will share with you what actually is going on today in sex education.